Hello and welcome to the Good Growth Podcast. Now, in many of our previous episodes, you would have heard our guests talk a lot about how Good Growth have helped project the voice of the customer uh, into their organisation. Now, this is a different approach from your typical creative agency. And in this podcast, I want to explore the tension between those approaches and discuss what is the most effective way to innovate. What is its relationship with digital and what does that mean for sales and marketing? So who better to ask than our panel of experts? Uh, let's meet them. First, we have a guru of digital and innovation. Uh, he's the chief innovation officer at the University of Warwick and former chief digital officer at O2, David Plum. We have the who's who of marketing, Simon Gulliford, currently chairman of Hendy Motor Group and former chief marketing director at Standard Life and Barclays. And finally, bring in a global commercial background and a, a strategist in change and organisation, Good Growth's chairman and co-founder, Professor Chris Bones. Welcome to you all. Hello there. Hi. Hey, Dan. Good to have you here. Uh, Chris, if I could start with you. Um, so Good Growth recently released a white paper on the fifth dimension. Uh, that explains that contrary to common perceptions, innovation is actually a discipline and process that needs data and insight. So why then is data so important in innovation? I think data is critical, not because it exists, but because of what you can do with it um, in order to develop deep insight about the customer problem, which you can then think about innovating uh, and working out how you test or prototype those innovations. So the difference for me, the importance, if you like, is creativity comes later in the cycle than it would in a classic uh, sort of marketing pitch. Uh, the big idea is great when you understand what the big problem is. Um, and the differentiation, I think, increasingly in successful businesses, um, uh, you, you know, including some of the brands we work for, is that they've worked out that they need to understand and have capability in, in pretty hardcore mathematics, and they need capability in ethnography, the ability to uh, uh, understand the, the, the why of the behavior. And they need to be able to put those together to, to capture that human problem. And once you can do that, you can then innovate in a way that those ideas are far more likely to create value than they would if you just come off some, some great idea from the top of your head. Because even if that great idea is brilliant, you understand what the problem was it was solving and where you can go to, therefore, build more value over time. So, so I think that's the essence of me, why data is really critical in this discussion. Simon, you've um, been instrumental in uh, the innovation of companies uh, such as Selfridges, EasyJet, several M FMCG brands too, um, through creating new approaches to their marketing, their strategic positioning. So uh, listen to that. Would you go along with Chris? Or surely marketing is mainly about creativity and big picture thinking rather than necessarily data? Is it not? So, so I would say that the, the data, having great data, is essential because that defines the constraint. Now, where I think great marketing brains can generally flourish is when they're able to look at the, the information which is available to, to everyone and then draw completely different conclusions. Um, a very good example of that would, would, would be the work we did with EasyJet. Uh, conventionally, the airline industry categorized three types of customers, business users, um, short stay, long stay. That, th th those were the established definitions which existed within the industry. Um, and the biggest of those by, by value, by some considerable margin, was business. Um, that's too, too, far too big a categorization. And when, when you went and looked, there was a whole, there was a whole um, um, phalanx of buyer behavior, which is completely different to that. Because what we observed was that there were lots and lots of people who were using a plane to travel to work. Now, using a plane to travel to work is very, very different to traveling from business. Um, and when we did the analysis, what, what we discovered was that there's a fluid workforce of plasterers, plumbers, bricklayers, and jobbing workers who would now see it just as easy to get on a plane in, in Luton and try and fly to Glasgow, sleep on a camp bed, and do five days plastering in, in the office block. Now, um, the interesting thing was nobody had picked that up. We, we then did the analysis of the people who were traveling most frequently from Barcelona to Madrid. And what we discovered was that lots and lots of people wanted to live by the sea, but there were more lucrative jobs in Madrid. So they got the flight first thing on a Monday morning, 
and then travel back on a Wednesday night and work from home on a Thursday and Friday. Um, that was exactly the same in terms of financial services um, in, in, in Edinburgh in particular and people living in, in, in London. So there was a massive untapped pool of customers who felt as if they were not being treated in the way in which they should be. Um, and when we reoriented the ability to book 50 flights in advance, um, people were delighted in, in the fact they were, they, they were purchasing the equivalent of a season ticket, but to fly on the first flight out of Luton on a Monday morning with EasyJet. I mean, previously, the systems had been configured that you had to buy one ticket at a time. Mm. Uh, and, and yet, potentially, the most lucrative and most loyal customers um, who worked in, worked in Edinburgh but, but, but lived in Hartenden um, weren't, weren't able to, to proffer up a significant sum of, uh, of money uh, in order to make their lives easier and, and, and to reduce the effort they were expending. So, so to go back to Chris's point, the, the detail is always in the data, but configure the data to see different things relative to your competitors. Because if you can't see different patterns, then, then what you end up doing is merely commoditizing the process and, 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 and you start to, 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 to lack an empathy with how the customer will value your ability to make, uh, to reduce the effort they have to expend yeah, on the on the value that they're trying to receive from the, the providing organisation. So, marketing for me has gone down a bit of a blind alley, and it's become preoccupied with communications. Whereas the best marketing I've ever been involved in has been associated with data interpretation. Yeah. So is that interpretation of data then you you're you're opening up new uh, markets, new segments, but also becoming close moving yourself closer to the customer because you're understanding the types of journeys that they're making and it's not just purely a, a bucket of three as you as you mentioned earlier yeah and it's and, and it's the data fields and being being able to, to to create hypotheses which you then have to test to see what the customer is prepared to trade off um, I know in my time you know working for various banks and financial services um, what what those organizations view as being important to the customer is completely irrelevant to them. So, you know, in, in financial services, you see countless numbers of investment management firms telling you that they are top decile, top quartile uh, performers. Um, but then when you ask them, so how much has the customer's investment increased by over the period concerned? They say, oh, well, the stock market's been a bit rocky and it's gone down by 10%. And they say, so so what are, you, what, what are you doing yourself, having a competition, measuring yourself against the shortest player in the team? The only thing that really matters to the customer is whether or not their money is increasing in value. Um, but, but, but people working in organizations such as that become institutionalized where it's internal measures of success, which are deemed to be more important, yeah, than the critical drivers of satisfaction that the customer is looking for. And you have to align both of those elements. Otherwise, you end up with an arrogant, introspective organization where the customer is deemed to be in a bit of an interference. David, just to bring you in here, you uh, own digital products um, at O2, uh, and uh, telecommunications is a is an industry which, of course, has changed rapidly in the last um, decade or two. How did you use data to innovate um, products there? And, and, and did, did, did your interpretation align with Chris and Simon's here? Yeah, thanks, Dan. I mean, I think it's uh, it's interesting for me because I, I like to think of it as sort of human-centered design, um, which is really trying to get to understand the human on one side and their problems, their needs, the unmet needs. Um, and then on the other side, um, I'm thinking about how we can bring different data sets together to create insights that have never been possible before. And I think we're sort of starting to call that smart now. So... Uh, a way that digital and, and data can be collected and turned into insights. And so when I'm able to put together teams that are passionate about solving a human's need, um, and I'm able to bring in data sets that have never been seen before and do some sort of design sprint with them, um, where we, we're, what we're essentially looking to do is to, is to build some hypotheses um, of you know, would our potential customers, would our segments value uh, the potential services that we're building? And, and what I like about design sprints is that, you know, by the end of the first week, you are, you know, you're proposing and presenting back your suggestion to your potential customers. You're doing structured interviews that you video, you capture their feedback, and then by the time you get to your second week, 
you're thinking about um, how am I going to test this? So um, if it's something, um, an additional corporate uh, product, then you might put something on your website that's um, you know, a button to click. You see how many people click it. You haven't actually built the product. You're just testing whether people are interested um, and, and starting to bring them in as a community and start to, to, to gather how interested they are, whether they want to tell you um, about their needs and how you co-create. So I, I'm really interested in this kind of human-centered design and data insights and how we bring them together in a sprint. I suppose when I kind of look back, um, examples that I've seen sort of personally, I mean, we had the vision about five years ago um, to essentially create lifestyle insurance. Um, and as a mobile company, you know, we were able to see data about uh, where you go online, where you go in the real world. Um, so, you know, as long as you have security and privacy, actually you, you have an incredibly rich set of data. And, and the concept with lifestyle insurance is, you know, the insurance changes based on your behaviour. So you've always got the right insurance for what you need today, you're not, but you're not overpaying. So if I drive down to Heathrow and take a flight uh, and my car is in a safe car park in Heathrow for, for two weeks, my car needs a different level of insurance just sitting there. Uh, my house might need a different level of insurance because actually I'm not in it. And the fact that I'm in another country means that I need a certain amount of travel insurance. Well, all of that data can be collected and actually you can start to imagine a lifestyle type insurance way of, of living where you, you, you pay less, but you've got, you, on every given day, you have what you need. And I think what we saw um, when we launched O2 Drive, which was the first step towards this lifestyle vision, is that, you know, we could get some very, very rich data sets and bring them together that had never been together before. And if we put the human in the middle and designed it around the human. So if I give you an example, um, we research when uh, people were most likely to have accidents. And actually, um, it's when the temperature drops by 10 degrees and it's freezing for the first time in the winter. Because that's the moment when you're, uh, you're still driving at 70 miles an hour because you assume it's the day before's weather. Um, and actually, but it's dropped by more than 10, it's freezing and it's the first time this winter. So we realised that if we could send out a text message in the morning to one of our O2 Drive insurance customers and say, just to let you know, statistically, this is the most likely day you're going to have an accident. Please drive carefully out there. We'd really like to know um, that you get to work safely. I mean, done in a really lovely human sort of way, but really about protecting our risk because we're an insurance company. Um, so, so I think for me, the, the marrying of the data sets with the human sense of design um, is, is, is the way that I kind of feel that we have, we have to sort of embrace this challenge. So, so that, that, that's a really interesting insight in terms of your ability to aggregate that data. Um, the, the, the interesting thing is um, that, that that was understood by the vehicle repair fraternity 20 years ago. Yeah, but mm -hmm. none of the data was aggregated. We, we, we used to own um, two accident repair shops uh, just off the A1 at, uh, at Grantham. Um, and those of you familiar with the A1, there's a, there's a particular dip in the road, which is a frost pocket. Uh, and we would always look at the, the, the weather forecast um, um, the night before, um, from, from November through until the end of February, because we knew if, 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 if frost was, was forecast, then we needed to put more recovery vehicles on the road and we needed to be offering our, our, our drivers and our, our panel beaters uh, extra overtime because frost equals more work for the, more work for the, um, for the body shops. Now, the interesting thing about O2 is you've used, you've used technology and aggregated data to scale that up and to communicate. Uh, but interestingly, for anybody who was in the body shop game, they knew, they knew that. Yeah, 20, 25 years ago. So it, it's a fantastic application of, of the way in which you view scale in order to create greater insight, in order to modify ultimate behavior. I think that's right. And I think, I think sorry, I think that behavior is an interesting thing to, to think about here. We, we were also looking at young people who might speed. 
Um, and, and so we, we, we hired some psychologists who were sort of in their late 20s, not long out of university, so had the skills and the capabilities, but actually could relate to an 18, 19 year old. And when we saw speeding incidents, we would get the psychologist to call them up and have that conversation of, well, we notice you speed every Tuesday evening. Where do you go every Tuesday? Oh, well, I'm going to work. Okay, well, um, let's look at the triggers. Now let's look at the costs and the potential. So we were sort of putting the humor at the center of it. We were talking about trying to make their insurance cheaper, trying to make them safer. But actually, what we were really trying to do was we, we were recognizing that um, if a young person has an accident and there's four of them in the car and it's quite serious from an insurance company's point of view, that could be millions of pounds over the next 20, 30 years of their life in bills. So by trying to take out the worst of that behavior in a human-centered way, but using the data, to, so you call the right people, the people that are habitual speeders and have four people in the car, perhaps they're driving late at night. So for me, that joining of the data and the human-centered um, design is, is, is where the magic happens. And I think to, to, to build on those two comments, the fascinating thing that digital then does to, I guess, to Simon's point, right, so 20 years ago we knew this, but so, so what digital does is it gives you that data. Indeed, as we discover working with, with David on, on some of that O2 insurance project, um, and what it then allows you to do is to test for the most appropriate way of using that so that you have the behavior change you want in the, the most amount of people you can possibly achieve it for. Uh, and by getting reasonably large scale engagement, uh, you can test rapidly uh, online very cheaply uh, and you can find that most effective conversation which delivers the behavior change that benefits everybody. Uh, and one of the things I think that is still underutilized in the digital space is people see it quite often as a great transmitter, but they don't realize it's a tremendous receiver. Yeah. Uh, and really using it to test and learn rapidly so you move from your early engagement which might focus on uh, you know something that doesn't matter to the speeding driver and, and you might ultimately wake up but you might work out after you know three months you found a message that really matters to the driver uh, and the consequence of it matching to them is actually you're much better off as an insurance business David I just want to uh ask you as well now looking forward um where do you think we're heading you, you talk about the, the the human element that say o2 uh, drive brought into into car insurance is that more human concept and human element do you think we're going to see more of that as we as as, as we evolve and um and how do you think digital will be shaping how businesses uh, innovate well, I mean, I, I, I take a, a sort of a really big step back um, when I think about digital and trying to understand the changes that we see. Are they permanent changes, structural changes, or are they just a cyclical um, where we are in the cycle and things are going to move around? So I try and think of it in those two ways, really. Um, and I think there are some structural changes and there are some trends that are being accelerated uh, and you can think of things like um, direct customer, uh, you know, missing out the the middleman. Um, you know, Chris, I think, has, 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 uh, has worked on a, a piece with Heinz, which is, I think, very powerful. But I've also seen some very small businesses. Uh, you know, I've, I've been advising a, a company that sells a million flowers a year that all of their routes to market disappeared so they set up a website they bundled the packages into sort of 30 pound lots because below 30 pounds it didn't make a lot of sense to pay for the courier so i think that acceleration of that trend and you can imagine that if that trend starts to get coupled with the sort of values led um, buying behavior so um, I want to know that this was grown in a sustainable way. I want to know that the humans involved were treated properly. Um, so you can imagine the sort of direct to consumer, but products that were, 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 were values led. But it seems to me that those are structural changes that are coming. And, and there's a sort of, you can feel 
um, this sort of immovable, uh, unstoppable power of those. And I, and I actually feel it in places like cinemas uh, and moving to sort of digital to be able to buy the film without having to go to the cinema. So I think in lots of places there are some structural changes. Many of them, I think what we've seen are, are, are cyclical and will things will come back. Um, yes, you know, I still think we're going to see people in uh, retail showrooms having an experience. Uh, and whether that experience is Apple teaching your five-year-old uh, how to, to, to code, um, or, or whether it's somebody in Selfridges as your personal shopper. So, you know, I, I think that those experiences are still going to be desired to inspire and educate uh, individuals. And, and I guess also, you know, the, the delivery of the core staples, you know, we'd already seen a huge acceleration towards digital, um, you know, I think about 20% now in the UK by value. Um, it, it is actually sold over digital. I think that will uh, that trend will continue. Um, but actually, when I when I look at the, the services side of things, I start to think, well, how much of the uh, total GDP will be digital in the service end? Simon, based on uh, David's uh, assertions there, then what what do you think has to change uh, in the marketing world to to adapt to where where David thinks we're heading? Well, well, first of all, we need we need better people in marketing. We need people who are financially literate, data literate, and are capable of doing hard sums as and when required. I think the the world of agency took a completely wrong turn when they took apart full service agencies and um, the likes of Martin Sorrell and WPP decided to silo the industry into media buyers, media planners, the creative, and so on and so forth. Each each with their own PL and each, each, each separately structured. Um, in essence, if, if, if you're going into a marketing services agency, they, their primary task is to help you sell more stuff. And um, and I think that the, the number of agencies have, have got into talking a load of Tommy Rot about uh, brand development strategies and and upping levels of recall and consideration. Well, well that's all fine and dandy. Uh, but when you're spending your own money, Brand building is measured by have we sold more stuff than we did last week. Mm. Um, whereas when you're spending somebody else's money to say this has been brand enhancing, even though you haven't sold a single unit in, in addition, uh, doesn't cut the mustard. So in terms of real constraint, I think marketing teams have to get much, much closer to finance teams. They have to understand how value is generated and they have to really understand yeah, what needs to be done in order to cause the ultimate consumer to have a significantly higher intention to use some of these products or services. Hmm. Um, I, I, I do think we've got spurious measures which are being used within the world of marketing. I mean, I sit on a number of, board of boards of directors um, where um, net promoter scores are regarded as having the accuracy of, 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 of codified law. Um, it, it, they're about as accurate as horoscopes, as far as I can see. Um, <laughs> It, it, it doesn't be a root cause analysis. It doesn't actually show you what the trade-offs are that are taking place when people make a decision. And there's another implicit assumption that if you're not satisfied uh, with an organisation, you won't go back. Well, uh, if that was the case, we wouldn't have a banking industry in the UK. Um, I, I think a far more accurate indication of future future behaviour is is the amount of effort that somebody has to expend in order to get a product or service. And, and going back to the initial point, um, one of the tasks in terms of the world of digital is to reduce the amount of effort that the customer expends hmm. um, in order to, take, to obtain a particular product or services. Now, the, the poor digital operators are the ones that actually unnecessarily increase the levels of effort in, in order to enable the customer to get what they wanted. And, and, and we all know of examples of, uh, of websites that do that to us. But I, I, I do think there needs to be a fundamental recalibration as to what the task of marketing is. And, and ultimately, the task of marketing is to get people to, to buy more of the product that, that is deemed to be valued by the customer. And uh, and if you don't do that, you haven't got a business. And uh, marketing needs to be better connected with that particular process. So, Chris, what do you think? How how then are uh, businesses going to need to respond in regards uh, to their organisational organizational models to, to meet the customer needs? So, <clears throat> so if you took David's proposition with digital at least as a front end to the engagement i'm still trying to work out how if i've been the 
subject to the funeral, I could give feedback afterwards, but I'll, I'm sure I'll come to that. Um, but, I, but I think, you know, if you took David's proposition, services are inevitably, at least at the front end, going to become digital. And Simon said the consequence is, and I absolutely agree, you need to rethink and, re in fact, in fairness, reconnect marketing back to uh, uh, the core value drivers in the business. Then uh, <clears throat> what that says to me is that the thing that an awful lot of people miss around business building and business innovation has to be moved from an implicit assumption and somehow we all we'll just do it to, to an explicit codification, which is you need an operating model in any organisation that, that reflects and defines how the organisation is going to work in order to make money from the business model. And the thing I think in our observation of the way uh, businesses are coming into innovation, digital, uh, and this sort of um, intersection then with marketing is that they haven't read it, they haven't either defined an operating model at all, or they're still trying to work with an operating model that's 30 years old, mm -hmm. one that, that is entirely producer-led, that says if you stick something on a shelf in Tesco, it will sell. Um, uh, and, you know, that's not true anymore. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the things that's interesting, and David referred to this, the Heinz work, I think that one of the things that Heinz have got perhaps a bit faster, a bit quicker than some of their competitors, but, but the rest of big FMCG is, is already playing in the space as well, is that, you know, you don't necessarily want direct consumer to compete with Tesco, but you want enough interaction and enough uh, customer engagement in it for you to understand the shopper as well, if not better than the retail. Uh, and the transformation that requires is a complete rethink about the roles of functions and the development of processes that cut right across functions, from finance to IT to marketing to product, uh, and make all of those functions start with the customer. You know, loads of businesses call themselves customer-centric. Uh, many of us have got experience of people who say the customer's at the heart of what they do, um, and then uh, feel from the experience is awful. I have to say I've been absolutely uh, amazed by the amount of adverts, particularly in the financial services sector recently, full of their employees saying they're all on the end of the phone to help. And if you've tried to phone a bank in the last six, six weeks or an insurance company, you know the chances are you won't go through for days. And if they'd spent you know, the million quid they put on the advert in employing 10,000 more people to answer the phone, I might actually believe that they're there to help. And I think increasingly, it's a it, you know that's those those are businesses who've not changed the operating. Um, I, I, I mean that's a that's a wonderful example, Chris. You know the the, the large bank by your side ad. I mean they've 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 they've, they've, they've clearly spent a fortune um, um, buying up discounted media space on television. Um, by your side, I mean if 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 you were to if you were to reflect what they're actually doing, uh, they'd have to say. Well, we're currently hiding behind the sofa, and we don't want to talk to you, uh, because because that's the experience both of individuals and and of businesses that have been in, in connection with with Lloyd's. They they are in essence closed for business as we speak at the moment, yeah. um, and yet they continue to pump out this this esoteric images of horses experiencing enormous joy galloping across deserted beaches, uh, which has nothing to do with the reality of what people are looking for from their backs at the moment. Mm. Uh, the three of you pieced together a fascinating story there, and it, what's great is that you're, you're both from different. You're all three of you are from different backgrounds, um, but the the way you'd you'd approach in in aligning the importance of data to innovate is it, it, it has a lot of similarities there too. I'd like to wrap up with a brief final thought from each of you. Um, Simon, first to you. What kind of organisations are you seeing responding best to COVID, and, and why is that? Well, I'll give you a few examples. The one that's really impressed me is AXA PPP. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that, that, that um, Hendy pay for my uh, medical cover with that organisation, but they're, they're aware of what my healthcare issues are. Um, and they immediately got in touch uh, and said, look, we know you need regular prescriptions for a particular uh, treatment plan that you're on. Um, you don't need to go to the doctors. We can all organise it for you. We'll get it sent to your house. Um, and, and they preempted a problem which I hadn't really thought about, but they were there way in advance of, 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 of the dilemmas associated with 
visiting your GP and coordinating that with uh, with, with pharmacies. So I thought that was outstanding because they used data in order to come up with the solution. They did it in a timely and, and, and really friendly friendly manner, showing a degree of insight and a degree of trust. Um, another organisation that has impressed the socks off me has been Warburton's. Um, I mean, although they make absolutely brilliant bread, um, their, their major competitive advantage is the quality of their distribution and their ability to service multiple outlets. Um, and the way in which they were able to take sales-based information and an understanding of what customers wanted most at retail level, they completely reconfigured their production schedules um, and completely reoriented the way in which they did distribution in order to, 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 to cope with the explosion in demand which was characterised in the first four weeks of lockdown. Um, so the, their stock out position was significantly lower than would have been the case for, for, for rivals such as Hovis and, and Kingsmill. Um, and the speed of response was, 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 was breathtaking. And then I would say, uh, born out of a massive constraint, um, when you've got thousands and thousands of cars sitting in the compound, which you've already paid for, uh, it's quite important if you're a car dealership to, to get the product shifted. And... Uh, and, 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 and the marketing people and the operations people within Hendy figured out a way in the space of two weeks to securely distribute cars in a way which was sanitized, um, safe, protected both the customer and the staff accordingly. And, uh, you know, we've now got a digital distribution business that was um, less than nascent before we went into this crisis. So, so we've learned an enormous amount very quickly. David, are we on the cusp of a permanent change in the landscape of digital and innovation or, or, or has that just has that change just been accelerated by uh, the current crisis? I mean no I, I absolutely do believe um, that this will make fundamental changes and, and in some areas we won't go back. Um, I, I'm deeply involved in autonomous vehicles and, and mobility um, as we sort of bring together the different players um, in the marketplace and, and I think what we've seen over the course of the last few months um, is, is people starting to think about their mobility in different ways, starting to think about how much do I need to work from uh, home or, or actually do I need to work from somewhere other than home, you know, will I work from the beach? Um, when I go to um, a city or uh, a campus, you know, am I going to be going on a, an electric vehicle, am I going to be in an autonomous taxi? And, you know, I, I think about the only way you make those things happen, those kind of systemic changes, are when we can bring together different people from the ecosystem. So, you know, we're deeply involved with reinventing batteries, uh, and you do that by bringing together chemists and physicists, material experts, the OEM, the supply chain. Um, and, and AI, and it, so you bring together those different disciplines, you go through uh, a process of experimentation and ideation, and you, you, you sort of bring together hypotheses that this is going to be something that a customer is going to value, it's going to change the human's life. All of that acceleration and all of that focus on new ways of working, I think now is backed by consumers who want change. Yeah, I do not want to keep travelling into a city every day. I do not want to go via a, a supermarket, you know, 10, 15 miles away. I want the community where I live, I want the people near me um, to, to, I want to see their values, I want to be part of them. There, there, there's fundamental changes in the psyche that's going on, and that will drive, I think, the need for some of these new digital businesses and some of these new digital communities, which will be everything from, you know, drones is one that I'm working on at the moment, delivering blood um, and organ replacement for the NHS, um, right the way through to scooters, electric scooters, so that people can sort of get to campus. And um, I think this kind of platform digital innovation approach where the user or the human can, can comment, give their needs, uh, as Chris says, you know, g g give their feedback in, and very, very quickly people can stand up uh, experiments and trials and see how many people are interested in what level of engagement. And that, for me, is, is something that's, that, that's come out of this change, and I hope we don't fully go back. Um, I, I, I saw today Parliament 
uh, voting in a one kilometer queue, um, socially distanced, when last week we were able to do it digitally, and my heart sank and thought, uh, we need real kind of leadership in this space to take this moment, because you look at the benefits of what's happened to the climate, uh, and what's happened to the environment uh, through this last sort of period, these last few months, we have real opportunity to make a change for our children's sake. Um, we, we, we have to, this has to be the moment, basically. Um, so, Chris, final question uh, to you. Then We've heard a little bit about Heinz to Home. What role can good growth play in helping businesses overcome and embrace the, this inevitable change that, that's forthcoming? So, to put this into a, a, a single sentence answer, um, the, the role we're playing with uh, all of our clients at the moment is to make sure their leaders are able to get a really clear answer when they're faced with um, uh, a bid for resources to invest in sales and marketing. It, it, and the answer is, is to this question, what insight about the customer is this proposal based on? And therefore, what confidence do we have that spending behind it will, will deliver results? This is a world where balance sheets are really, really under pressure. And if you're a CFO or CEO at the moment, you're looking to make sure that you can rebuild the balance sheet, you can maintain and retain your cash in it, uh, and that you're not really going to have a lot of time or a lot of energy to invest behind you know, big clunky projects with long payback periods, um, uh, um, unless they've got huge grounding in well-prepared, well-developed customer insight in which you can have confidence and where prototyping of one sort or another has shown you there's value to be made. So that's what we're helping businesses do. And I actually think it's the one thing that may differentiate you know, those who not just survive but thrive as they come out of this crisis and, uh, and those who may find it very difficult as they waste um, precious cash on stuff that's just not well thought through or data justified. A good point. Perfect. Well, that just uh, just about wraps things up. Um, so you can read all about uh, Heinz to Home story um, and our latest white paper, The Fifth Dimension, on our website, goodgrowth.co.uk. And keep an eye out for our LinkedIn post too. Uh, a lot going on there as well. But uh, Chris, David, Simon, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers.